take to your seats. We're going to start in a minute right now. Thank you. So, so before we start, again, uh, Dr. Henry needs no introduction. He's um, a bit of a corporate man. He's been on the board of Syme Dabi and uh, Highlands and Rollins, uh, several uh, plantation companies. And uh, he's also an avid moth collector. And he's the author of a, of a, a biography on Swetanam. So he's going to attempt to put about 700 pages into 30 minutes. And if we're lucky enough, we, he might share with us some of the more racy bits. Yeah. So over to you, uh, Dr. Henry. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honored to be invited to address such a distinguished company today. And I give thanks that my brief, which is essentially Swetnam's involvement in KL, starts in 1872, so I can safely stand on the sidelines uh, as I listen to the fascinating exposition of the early founders of KL, which we've just heard from Lubis and Salma. Frank Athelstan Swetnam first came out to Singapore in 1871. Malay states were largely unknown and unexplored, but Chinese interests in the Strait settlements of Penang and Singapore and Malacca were aware of the enormous tin resources in Pira and later Selangor. This led to near open warfare, which we've just heard about. Uh, this occurred particularly in Pira as well as in Selangor. Swetnam, aged 21, was an adventurous and curious young man. So in early 1872, when the opportunity presented itself to accompany J.D. Davidson, a partner, a legal partner in Rodike and Davidson in Singapore, to Kuala Lumpur, Swetnam jumped at the opportunity. Swetnam, uh, Davidson was visiting Kuala Lumpur to follow up on a case of abduction of a Chinese girl. The two of them set off by boat from Singapore to the mouth of the Klang River and proceeded some seven miles up the river to Klang, where they were met by Tunku Kudin, who we've heard quite a bit about already. He was the brother of the Sultan of Kedah, partly English educated, and he was later described as a needy adventurer with his wits about him. Having recently married the daughter of the elderly Sultan Abdul Samad of Selangor, he had persuaded his father-in-law to appoint him Viceroy of Selangor in exchange for the revenues of Langat. This all goes back to our earlier two talks. Sultan Abdul Samad, who presided over the affairs of Selangor, attempted to control the rich tin mines at the swampy confluence of the Klang and Gombak rivers adjacent to the site of today's Masjid Jami. Yapa Loy, the Capitan China, was the most powerful Chinese in the state at the time. He'd risen from being a penniless immigrant to a position of wealth and influence through hard work swift thought and equally swift action. He had previously offered bounties of 50 silver dollars for each enemy head delivered in front of his house in what was then the marketplace in Kuala Lumpur. And he admitted to Swetnam that he did a brisk business. Because his tin ore had to be exported down the Klang River to Klang, it was, naturally, it was natural that he should be allied to Tunku Kudin, who, as we've seen, controlled the town. Kudin arranged for a boat to convey Davidson and Swetnam up the river to Klang, and the journey took three days, rowing and poling. At Kuala Lumpur, they were entertained to dinner by Yap Loy, and Davidson pursued his inquiries for two days without success. Meantime, Swetnam wandered around Kuala Lumpur, 
and his impressions were not favorable. He walked into an empty hut where he found a dead Chinese slumped against the wall with a bullet through his chest. Later, when he walked out to a tin mine, he was led by a young Chinese who was nonchalantly carrying a loaded ten-chamber revolver slung over his shoulder from a stick. They decided to walk back to Klang. This took 12 hours through swamp, much of it up to their waists in water. For although they had a guide, there was no regular path. The whole episode brought home very clearly to Swettenham the problems posed by the lack of communications and the slowness of transport, problems which he was to tackle in due time with very considerable vigor. Thereafter, Swettenham's involvement with the affairs of Kuala Lumpur was marginal until he was confirmed as assistant resident in Selangor in December 74. In the course of this work, he visited other parts of the state, and this brought him back to Kuala Lumpur, where he was greatly impressed by the changes which Yapa Loy had developed since his first visit. There were wide streets, and as we've seen, separate Malay and Chinese quarters, and in front of Yap's house, the gambling booths, and the market. Boats were drawn up on the banks of the river to give access to the houses. The population was recorded as being about a thousand Chinese and five to seven hundred Malays, but no doubt many more in the hinterland, as we've had explained to us. He spent an extra day in Kuala Lumpur going round the town with Yap Loy who suggested, interestingly, that a road be made from Kuala Lumpur to Damansara. It was to be unmetalled, with a ditch on either side, at a cost of $13,000, or 750 per mile, which Swetnam considered reasonable, using Javanese labor. That night, once again, Yapa Loy gave a dinner to Swetnam, and then a show of Chinese opera. He departed the following morning. Swetnam subsequently wrote a report urging the building of a road from Damansara, the last navigable point on the Klang River, up to Kuala Lumpur, for at least the larger boats. His subsequent work auditing the affairs of the protected Malay states enabled Swetnam to make an unfavorable comparison between the outstanding work which Hugh Lowe was undertaking in Pira and the uncouth Bloomfield Douglas, who was the resident in Selangor, based in Klang. It provided Swetnam with the opportunity in 1878 to remark in his audit report that Yap Loy was clearing land, starting the land, starting the road from Damansara to the town, and operating kilns producing high-quality bricks, building material for the Singapore market. His job as auditor provided him with a base from which to launch attacks on Bloomfield Douglas administration, which was still based in Klang. By 1880, Swetnam was recommending that the center of the Selangor State Administration should be moved from Klang to Kuala Lumpur in view of the enormous amount of business which was being generated by the tin minings from Kuala Lumpur. This marked the first step in Kuala Lumpur's move or elevation eventually to become the capital of Malaysia. Swetnam took the view that the teeming largely Chinese mining population of Kuala Lumpur required careful treatment in their new country, quote, with the forms of whose government they are imperfectly acquainted, quote. Initially, Swetnam advised that to avoid expense, only the key offices of the resident treasurer, police, and government clerks concerned needed to be moved to Kuala Lumpur. 
residency was to be sited on the high ground on the West Bank, the area of the present Prime Minister's department, and currently the site of the Tunku Abdul Rahman Memorial. It was separated from the town by the river, and Douglas installed a howitzer on the residency terrace and enlivened governor's visits by target practice in the direction of the jungle outskirts. Swetnam's report covered the general planning in outline and was approved, although with modifications on his first visit to Kuala Lumpur later that year. Douglas was told to remove the building from Klang to Kuala Lumpur, more or less beam by beam. Weld took a close interest, Weld was the governor at the time, in an intriguing minute own in Swetnam's hand, but placed above Weld's signature, he remarked, I personally arranged these matters with the resident. The rest house will also be a residence for the Sultan when he visits Kuala Lumpur. It seems politically desirable that he should not be required act as a visit to, to be a visitor to the Capitan China and that his dignity should not be ignored. The date was changed from the 13th of May to the 13th of July, 1880, perhaps after Swetnam realized that by the 13th of May, Weld would not have had time since his arrival to visit Kuala Lumpur. Swetnam was adept at modifying the record when it suited his purposes. And concern for the accommodation of the Sultan throws an interesting light on the relations between the Malay and the Chinese communities at the time and the British perceptions of them. The Singapore response to Swetnam's critical report was sharp and the letter was no doubt checked if not written by Swetnam himself. Douglas was instructed to implement Swetnam's recommendations immediately and in 1882 as a result of further inquiries in which Swetnam played a key role, Douglas was forced to resign. Swetnam had a strong claim to succeeding him, and Kimberley at the Colonial Office in London, however, had doubts. Quote, is he exactly the man for Kuala Lumpur? Might he not drive the coach a little too fast? Nevertheless, he was appointed initially as acting resident Salangor towards the end of 1882. And this, in a way, marked the second step towards Kuala Lumpur becoming the capital of Malaysia. He was accompanied by his wife, the neurotic Sydney, after whom the lake in the Lake Gardens was initially named Sydney Lake. The administration was chaotic not entirely surprising after Douglas' regime of incompetence. What is now Medeca Square was a tapioca patch, while the site occupied by Gang Bangunan Abdul Samad, of which we will have more to say later, had on it flimsy shacks, liable to be blown away by any storm. When Swetnam arrived in Kuala Lumpur, there was only one man he felt he could rely upon, and that was Sires, the chief of police. Within a week, Swetnam was joined by J.P. Roger, who was an old Etonian with legal training and some private means. He must have felt some trepidation as he reviewed the situation and he was concerned about the possibility of financial irregularities. He asked two of his clerks, who he could trust, to check the November, to check the September accounts, which were found to be in order. And he then set off on a visit and audit of the districts. It's often said that new brooms sweep clean, and Swetnam was no exception. On October the 5th, he minuted to Jantz, the Chinese, Selenese medical dra officer who'd been drafted in from Labuan, quote, the present state of the town is not only a disgrace to the government, 
but I should think it's dangerous to health. End quote. Jantz recommended a local board of health and improvement, but Swettenham retorted that the governor did not think that it was yet desirable to establish such a municipality. So orders were given to employ the necessary labor, our carts to remove the ubiquitous refuse, which was taken to a new dump beyond Pudu Road. Police were ordered to put an end to the filthy habits of the Kuala Lumpur residents. It was reported the refuse of the drains is simply removed therefrom and laid on the side of the road, the stench of which I consider sufficient to create all kinds of disease. People were not to be allowed to throw rubbish onto the drains. Not much has happened on that in the last few years, has it? Enormous roads or verandas be blocked by hawkers, similarly. Bar parade and drill was to take place for an hour once a fortnight. When Weld visited on the 14th of October, 1882, he was met by a salute of guns from the residency, followed by a salute from Yafar Loy's house. He was appalled by what he found. I visited the hospital in some of the worst streets, which were pestilential. Although Mr. Swetnam, who had been employing men and carts to cleanse the latter ever since his arrival, said their present state would give me no idea of their condition a week previously. Conditions at the pauper hospital were disgusting, chiefly because the Selenese clerk Jantz was drunk most of the time, and in Weld's view, incapable of taking instructions from Swetnam. So Weld dismissed him on the spot. During the six days of Wells' visit, he went round all parts of Kuala Lumpur, uh, discussing the administration and the layout in some con de considerable detail. In a private letter to Kimberley at the colonial office, Weld noted that Swetnam's reports were remarkably careful and clear, and it was such a relief to have him instead of Douglas. Publicly, he was a little bit more circumspect, Noting how well Mr. Swetnam was taking the reins in his hands and energetically dealing with matters, he would sure that on his next visit he could rely upon a very different state of things. Roger acted as head of the administration while Swetnam was in Jugra with Weld, noting in his journal that clerks came into the office at 10 a.m. What's changed? Heads of departments at 11 a.m. Likewise. <laughs> Government departments were in a hopeless muddle, similarities, and he made proposals for a general improvement. Swetnam's experience with Dr. Jantz caused him to cast a jaundiced eye over several other Selenese officials who drifted into Selangor. He asked for them to produce separate reports, each of them, indicating what they've been doing since they arrived and issued sharp orders with them to get on with their work. Several were surveyors and he pointed out that he wanted the trace of a new line between the seventh Hello? Yep. The gradient was to be no more than 1 in 30, the most 1 in 25. He was clearly thinking of the railway to link Kuala uh, Lumpur and Klang. Swetnam was kept fully occupied during his first two months in Selangor, and as proof, his 1883 estimates, which were prepared in this period and submitted to Singapore at the end of November, ran to 115 pages written in his own hand on blue government minute paper. They were the first, for the first time prepared in the same format as the much better known format of the straight settlement sets, estimates, thus facilitating comparisons. Revenue was estimated to amount to 384,000, 
an increase of 149,000 over 1881, previously completed year. Substantial increases were estimated for the revenue farms. Previously let in 1881, they produced 16,500 for the year. Now they were estimated to yield 45,000 per year. Further criticism, if such was needed, for Douglas's floundering administration. In fact, the revenue farms were re-let for 62,000. Impounding areas were to be created in both Kuala Lumpur and Klang for stray cattle, which had become a nuisance. They could be redeemed at 25 cents per day per head when impounded. This would raise 3,500. After income, Swetnam considered expenditure, recommending a substantial number of new posts, and in many cases, generous increases of salaries and allowances for those in existing posts. The most significant aspect of the estimates, however, dealt with roads and buildings. Here we can understand something of Swetnam's confidence in and vision for the squalid, dirty town of Kuala Lumpur, for which he'd so recently assumed responsibility. For this purpose, he had prepared by the assistant surveyor eight sheets of large-scale plans of the town of Kuala Lumpur and the neighborhood, both the existing layout and what he proposed for the future. The sites of most of the proposed new buildings had in fact been chosen by Wells on his visit to Kuala Lumpur in 1882. The total estimate for the works and buildings was 40,000. Including in this was a new provision for the general hospital, new ward for the pauper hospital, and new housing accommodation for various heads of departments. Substantial sum was earmarked for a jetty at Damansara, where the Klang River ceased to be navigable. There was, however, a problem in these plans, because houses jutting into the high street, which belonged to Yapa Loy, would need to be pulled down if the high street was to be extended as Swetnam wished. There were also problems involving the layout of the new Kuala Lumpur between the astute old Yapa Loy and his youthful resident. He concluded his estimate, estimates by stating that after paying back private creditors and those holding Salanga state bonds and sums due to the Straits government, he hoped at the end of 1883 that the Salanga accounts would show a surplus of some 50,000. For 1883, we have a rough diary of Swetnam's activities it gives an idea of the sort of life which he was leading. Most of the time, at least half the day, was spent on correspondence in the office. And, like other residents, he was obliged to forward regularly to Singapore a journal of his activities. The evening was invariably spent going out to view the various construction projects. Chiefly at the time, the new hospital, the railway trace to Klang, and the extension of car tracks around Kuala Lumpur. They were put, pushed through the car tracks to the mining areas in Satapak, Batu Caves, and Klang Gates. Nearer to home, streets were being laid out at the confluence of the two rivers, while the bridge over the river at Market Street required careful planning. And he used the assistance of his brother, who was serving in Ceylon at the time, uh, to recruit draftsmen to assist him in this work. There were still major gaps in the administrative staff, particularly PWD, and as a result, Swetnam appears to have assumed most of this work himself for the first nine months. No mean feat when one considers the task he'd set himself. Once again, Swetnam drew on the assistance of his elder brother to uh, recruit a head of the PWD, a man called Bellamy, and then A.C. Norman as his assistant superintendent and draftsman. 
It was inevitable that Swetnam should have had problems with Yap Loy. When he wanted the government to resume possession of the rectangular block of land in which the gaming booths and a very insecure shed called the Market stand, Yap, who owned and managed both buildings, appealed to the State Council on the grounds that the shopkeepers would be ruined were the buildings removed. Swetnam maintained the area had to be cleared because it was in its existing condition immoral, brothels, <laughs> and unhygienic. Yap was tenacious and stubborn, for in January, Swetnam noted he'd had further discussions with him. But eventually, Swetnam won out with the assistance of Weld. His work on the estimates in 1884 was almost as voluminous as for 1883 running to 85 pages, uh, showing that the finances were on a much stronger basis. Towards the end of the 1880s, Swetnam, who had in the meantime spent two or three years working as acting resident in Pira while Hugh Lowe was on leave, but at the end of the 1880s, Swetnam was succeeded as resident by arch-rival W.E. Maxwell, who wasted no time in investigating irregular land office matters, including the discovery that certain blocks of land had been registered in the name of Meta Rome, widow of a wealthy Australian farmer, visitor to KL, and allegedly one of Swetnam's mistresses. Further embarrassment was in store when Swetnam, when Maxwell investigated the building of the Sultan Abdul Stamad State Secretariat buildings opposite the Salanga Club. The land which had originally been owned by Yap Loy had been purchased by Swetnam shortly after he became resident of Salango. Swetnam, by the time the proposal for the State Secretariat buildings was raised, was on leave, but acting through W.H. Treacher, who took steps to minimize the publicity, Swetnam was obliged to sell the land back to the Selangor state. Swetnam's assumption when he came back from leave of the post of resident general, which by then was to be based in Kuala Lumpur, meant that Kuala Lumpur's position as the future capital of Malaysia was assured to the chagrin of Raja Idris of Pira. Worse was yet to come, for when the State Secretariat buildings were completed, Swetnam had returned from leave and taken up his new post as the first Resident General. So it fell to him to officiate at the official opening of the Sultan Abdul Samad building on the 3rd of April, 1897. Originally, there had been plans for a grand opening, significantly scaled down at Swetnam's insistence he realized how embarrassing the situation would be. Most of the guests would have known of the full story of how he'd speculated on the land. Party ended just after midnight, again at Swetnam's insistence. Normally such parties lasted significantly longer. No doubt there was a lot of sniggering into the sleeves of the visitors who knew what the background was. His final contribution to the development of KL was the construction of Carcosa, which after Medeca became residence of the High Commissioner till the early 80s. It was described in the local press as Mr. Swetnam's palace, and when opened, was celebrated by a lavish fancy dress ball. In conclusion, Swetnam was responsible for laying out and supervising the construction of the center of Kuala Lumpur chiefly surrounding what is now Medeca Square and the alignment of the main thoroughfares and railways leading out therefrom. We should perhaps also mention that he had a major hand in the establishment of the Institute of Medical Research, um, instigated not entirely coincidentally by the fact that uh, the man who we believe who was his illegitimate son was training to be a doctor and Swetnam was anxious to uh, do the right thing with the medical community. 
Were his ghost to return today, he would probably only recognize Medeca Square and the remains of Carcosa. Thank you. Thank you, Henry, and we'll take uh, another short break before we have before we invite um, Edin at 11:05. And and just to share, um, how how many of you are aware that this road that you came in used to be known as Clifford Road, named after Hugh Clifford. And of course, and if you turn right and you get to the T junction, that's uh, Swettenham Road. So where we are today is very much where the British had reserved this area for themselves. The nice, hilly and green parts. So take a break, I'll see you at 11.05, thank you. <laughs>